Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, come on, I was teaching fifth graders on Friday. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, much better, I'll let them know. Um, I am Melissa Jasefiak. I'm the director of Essex Historical Society, and thank you for coming on, out on this not snowy Sunday afternoon. Um, EHS extends our heartfelt thanks to Susan Carpenter, Barbara Ryan, and the team here at Essex Meadows for hosting this year's winter lecture series at this beautiful, beautiful venue. You've gone above and beyond in making our audiences feel welcome and ensuring that this was our most popular series ever. Please put your hands together for Essex Meadows. Thank you very much. The theme of this year's series focuses on Ivoryton, one of Essex's three villages, which is the focus of our recently published book in collaboration with Essex Land Trust. We only have three more copies left. By the way, it's about to go into reprinting. As we conclude this year's series, historian Sharon Cohen will discuss Connecticut's war production work in World War II, specifically the manufacture of wooden gliders by Ivoryton's Pratt Reed and Company. EHS can bring you this high quality lecture series for free, as are most of our programs, thanks, thanks to the generous support from our membership, people just like you, who ensure that everyone has free access to local history. At the end of today's talk, please speak with one of our board members at the welcome table in the back, where you can pick up more membership information, as well as purchase our new Ivoryton book and the one on Centerbrook and also Falls River Cove. To learn more about EHS, our events, or our membership program, please visit our website at www.essexhistory.org. Sign up for our email list or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. We thank you in advance. Now on to this afternoon's speaker. Sharon L. Cohen hails from Wisconsin. She headed east to pursue her MA degree at Fairfield University and also to raise a family. She served as a communication consultant for several Connecticut businesses. A published author several times over, Ms. Cohen has written on a variety of topics, including the mental health crisis following the tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary. Her latest book on Connecticut's role in World War II's industries relies upon her great interest in history and the resilience of humanity. Please join me in welcoming Sharon L. Cohen. I wanted to welcome you all here. Thank you so much for having me. I haven't been up in this area very much, and we have a 300-year-old house in Newtown, so I feel like I should move it here because it would fit much better here. And thank you for coming out in such a cold day, but I'm glad there was no snow. That was really wonderful. So today I'm going to be talking to you about Pratt Reed and what they did in World War II. But it's part of a whole book that I did on what would happen during World War II in all companies across the state. And in 1940, 1946, the Department of War Records here in the state of Connecticut wrote to many companies across the, uh, across the state asking them to talk specifically about the experiences that they had during the war because they wanted to get it firsthand and they wanted to learn what Connecticut had done. I, one of the points was that they wanted to ensure that Connecticut received the due rewards for what they had contributed. And even though I'm from Wisconsin, uh, where American Motors was made, uh, I would I do say that I truly believe that if Connecticut was not involved with this war, as far as engines and propellers and space uh, and G suit for, uh, force suits, everything that they made, I'm not sure if the war really would have been won. So it's incredible what you uh, everybody did here. So I was fortunate, as I said, to get uh, these original reports. They're up in the archives, up in the state. And one of them, these reports, was by James Gould, who was then president in, of uh, Pratt Reed. And so I, and you'll see many times during this that where I'm quoting him directly, because I have his words firsthand, which is a wonderful thing for a historian to have. So let's travel now back in our time machine 
and go back to the 1930s in the United States. This was a very difficult time, of course. It was a time of unrest. And our country was divided, mainly because we had were involved still, even though there was several decades later, we were still trying to get over the great world war to end all wars, but of course it wasn't. And there were, there were 320,000 people who had died and 240,000 who were wounded. And of course, many of those 240,000 were still alive and dealing with their psychological and their physical pain. And so there was, by many people, there was a great resistance of converting to civilian to military production. And we were, we were at a very low point in our, in our military life. And we were the only, the 18th largest worldwide army, even smaller than Switzerland. And during World War I, we had to play catch up. And in order to go into World War II, we were gonna to have to play catch up because again, we went back down to earlier levels. And on top of all of this, there was the Great Depression. So there were millions of people who were without jobs, who were hungry, who were without homes, and who were truly struggling. This was very difficult for President Roosevelt. He was elected purposely because he was to bring back the country socially, economically, and to unite us once again as a very strong, powerful nation. But yet, he saw what was happening in Europe, and he hated Hitler, and he knew that Hitler was not someone who was gonna be able to be stopped. And, and as things went on, and as uh, Europe, uh, Germany went into Poland, he said, God be with us. Because he knew that eventually the United States may have to actually get into this war. And so rather than saying, okay, we're gonna go into war, he did something a step before that. And he called it the arsenal of democracy. And this is what he said. That it is the purpose of the nation to build now with all possible speed every machine, every arsenal, every factory that we need to manufacture our defense material. We have the men, the skill, the wealth, and above all, the will. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. So he was not saying we're going to go into war, but he was saying that there was going to be another war here in the United States. And that war was an industrial war. Our, our, our companies, our factories, they had to start beefing up. And one of the things that they, we had to do at this point was that we had to start helping Europe. And Pratt Whitney, not Pratt Reed, Pratt Whitney at this point was making, starting to make engines for France and for Germany. And at the, by the end of the war, Pratt Whitney had made 300,000 engines. So it's incredible when you think about this. But guess what? They weren't the only ones who were thinking about this at this time. Mr. Gould was president of Pratt Reed at this time said, oh no, nobody's gonna want pianos in World War if there's a World War II. Why would they say, oh yeah, let's bring over your pianos and let's fight the war with pianos. And so he said, what are we gonna do? We gotta do something. And in this, from his report, as long as six months before World War II, Pratt Reed decided we would eventually become involved and tried to plan ahead as to what we could do to be of assistance. He was thinking of this and, uh, because of the war. He was also thinking of this because of his company. He was a mover and a shaker. He was someone who was always looking ahead and seeing how, he could keep the com how they could keep the company going. So what did he go into? Gliders, of all things, okay? But not hand gliders like this. What they went into are military gliders. 
Now, when Pratt, Pratt Reed started to make gliders, and we'll get into this more in a little bit later, there were no military gliders in the United States. They were in Germany, they were in Russia. Uh, we, there were some engineers who were looking at them and, uh, here in this country, but this was a brand new area. This is what is so incredible. And so I, you, I had to go back in history to try to figure out how we got into gliders. And so I'm going to give you a scenario. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. We'll see. So these military gliders were, were huge beasts. They were constructed of wood and steel. And then on this outside, they had an exterior cloth. They were 15 feet high, 49 feet long, 84 feet wingspan alone without anything in them they weighed two tons and then when they put things in them they were 7500 pounds full and inside they carried two pilots 13 troops a jeep or some other kind of vehicle light tanks anti-aircraft guns or whatever was needed at the battle site and so it's incredible what they could carry and how big they were and this is how they were towed. They had to be picked up and they had to be led to the place that they were gonna go. And so they, we, in most cases in the United States, they were towed with a nylon rope by a Douglas C-47 at 150 miles per hour and 2,000 feet high. And then when they got close to the target, they were released and they gl glided in to where they were going and landed. And they brought troops, weapons, vehicles, and the best thing were they, no they were noiseless and many times undetected. So how in the world did Pratt Reed, that was making piano mechanisms, of all things, get into gliders? A completely new field of development. Again, my scenario. Okay, we have World War I. The Versailles Treaty that said that Germany could no longer build or maintain their air force. And, we're, and the uh, Versailles Treaty stipulated that the Germans could no longer make, have an air force and they completely disbanded the air force. And they wanted to continue though to train pilots. So what did they do? They were very clever. They started glider clubs. And as you can see here, the young men here, the, were the young Hitler boys, were already starting to study gliders. And they had a lot of glider clubs for youth and adults. And eventually, they learned, these pilots learned enough that they would go into the Nazi Luftwaffe. Hitler also saw in Russia that they were making an assault glider. And they had not used it in war at this point, but Hitler was smart enough to realize that this was something that definitely could be done. But there was a gentleman here in the United States by the name of U.S. Colonel Richard C. Dent, who was an engineer and who was looking at the feasibility of military gliders. And he said to the United States Army Air Force, we have to get into gliders. And they said, oh, those damn gliders. They're like toys. We don't care about gliders. We have, you know, we have companies across the United States who are making engines. And those are, that's where we're putting our emphasis. We can't make these, these gliders. And so he was so frustrated, Dent was so frustrated that he said, I'm gonna start building these gliders across the United States, at least parts of these, these gliders. And he contacted Pratt, Pratt Reed. What I don't know is why he contacted them. Was it because he knew someone in Pratt Reed? Or was it because they were so well versed in woodcraft because they were making these wonderful piano mechanisms? I, I can't find out, but whatever it was, 
He went to Pratt Reed as well as other companies across the United States. But then what happened? In May of 1940, the Germans, nine German military gliders with 87 troops landed on what was to believe the impregnable Fort Ivan Imal in Belgium. On top of the fort, there was a grass on the roof and the gliders came in, they landed, and um, before anybody knew anything, they had taken over the, the, the fort and they had taken over Belgium. A year later, German invaded with 53 gliders and 750 troops, and the same thing happened to Crete. Now, guess what the army did at this point? They weren't damn gliders anymore. Now they said, well, we'd better get into this glider business. <laughs> and they started, they said, but we don't even have pilots. We don't even know, we don't have anybody to even man these, uh, these gliders. So they started an official glider training program. So now let's go back to Pratt Reed, all right? They were making these parts of gliders. And in the mid-1941, aviator Roger Griswold, engineer Michael E. Glurhoff, glider pilot designer Parker Lennon, developed a military training cargo glider. And they said to the Army and the Navy, we've made this prototype, are you interested? The Army said, no, at this point, we have enough. We have enough companies that are doing this, and we are training pilots at different airports across the United States. The Navy said, yes, we are interested. Please build 100 of them. But what happened in the meantime? Pearl Harbor. And gliders work fine in Europe, but they aren't very good for islands and jungles and water. And the, the Navy said, well, maybe we can make an amphibious one, but that never materialized. So what happened to these gliders? They ended up in crates, they were never opened up. They were put into storage. And at the end of the war, they were taken out and the wood was so precious, so wonderful, that they made, they made the, with the wood, they made other items, buildings and other things. And the gliders themselves were sold off to different people, including for weather reports. Because the gliders, they learned that the gliders were best good way to, to get the weather. So here we go back to Mr. Gould again, this clever Mr. Gould. He said, oh, we're no longer in the piano business. We are now in the aeronautical business. And this is the way we're going to market ourselves. And so he started the Gould Aeronautical Division. And so he was a completely different entity. Pratt Reed was no longer to be considered about pianos at Ivory. Now they're going to be in the aeronautical business. So of course, as I mentioned, with Pearl Harbor, in the midst of all of this, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And Roosevelt said, powerful enemies must be outfought and outproduced. We must outproduce them overwhelmingly so that there can be no question of our ability to provide a crushing superiority of equipment in any theater of the world war. So now, no longer, are we, we are the arsenal of democracy, but we now are at true war in, in overseas and here in this country. We are now in an a full industrial war in Connecticut. And so he established the War Production Board in 1942 and the War Mobilization Office in 1943. So imagine if today, all of a sudden, we were at war, and all of the con all of the companies across the United States had to immediately change over. And this is what happened: as soon as Pearl Harbor was bombed, all the companies across the United States had to convert from war from consumer items to war items. And then, secondly, they had to change their raw materials. We were getting, we were getting uh, rubber from overseas, no longer. We had to go to synthetic rubber. 
and over in US rubber and part of this actually in Connecticut, they started using synthetic rubber. Um, the silk was no longer obtainable. So the first parachute that came down made out of rayon from DuPont was here in Connecticut and it was made by Cheney Parachutes. And um, again, it was not the original silk. This was happening everywhere. And oh, thirdly, they had to develop their new labor. There were many men who were going off to, uh, to war. There were women going off to war. And that left a lot of the companies without labor. So they had to hire new people, immigrants, people from Puerto Rico, from Mexico, African Americans, and women. Women were the big thing then. And so um, they, not only did they have to train these people in, in making new products, many of these people had never ever worked in a factory before. And now they were working, you know, not only nine to five, maybe seven to eight, seven in the morning to eight in the, in the night. And thousands of people came to Connecticut to work here. And then lastly, that was not enough to make the materials that we had been making in World War I. But now we had to be innovators. Like Mr. Gould and Pratt Reed, we had to start making new things. And it's incredible, absolutely incredible, all the things, new things that were made in, in, in Connecticut. It just is amazing. So let's talk about Mr. Gould's aeronautical vision here. Um, they needed now, the, the Army needed to make 15,000 gliders over the d d war period, okay, 15,000 of these. And they went to Waco, which was the only company that they found across the United States that had the experience and the time with aeronautics that they really thought that they could do these gliders. But Waco could not, by any means, develop uh, 15,000 by themselves. So they had a subcontract. And guess where they went? Pratt Reed, right? And so Pratt Reed was one of 12 companies that started building these Waco CG4A cargo gliders. And Pratt Reed had more experience, and many of these companies, of the 12 companies, did not, and by the end of the war they were gone because they didn't have the true experience. And in fact, the um, Pratt Reed needed help, <clears throat> and the, 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 there were engineers who came into Pratt Reed to help them develop, at the beginning, to help them develop the glider. And so, as I said, there was about 15,000 that were built in total, and that's more than even our fighter planes. There were about 7,000 of the Corsair built. This is an incredible number. And they were involved in all the major campaigns. In, uh, in Sicily, Burma, Normandy, France, Holland, Bastogne, Rhine River Crossing. They were in all of these. But let's go back, to, uh, you know, I want to bring in the human element here, please, now. World War II was the most violent and destructive armed conflict in the history of mankind. Thousands of books, films, and memorials have been dedicated to the conflict. Yet one unwritten and unheralded chapter remains. The story of America's World War II glider pilots. <laughs> Remember, there were no glider pilots, right? <laughs> the beginning of all of this. And they weren't going to use their pilots that were going to be in the, in the Air Force and the fighter planes. And they, 6,000 men, volunteered to be glider pilots, despite the fact that they named these glider, gliders death crates and flying coffins because so many of them, of the pilots, were injured or died in these. And why? Okay, imagine now these gliders are coming in. 
They're coming in with bad weather. They're going to be landing where there may be barbed wire. They may be landing where Germans have put obstacles in the fields. They may be landing where they're landing on top of each other because there's not enough room. And, 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 and above all of that, they didn't give the pilots much in, in, um, infantry training because they weren't supposed to be in the infantry. They were supposed to land, get out of the way, and, 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 and not be involved. And many times it was behind um, enemy lines that they landed. So these guys were truly, truly amazing. Okay, so Mr. Gould said, this is not enough that we're making these gliders. Let's try something new. So he said, why don't we take a glider, of all things, and go and do a cross-Atlantic flight? Okay? So in 1943, imagine that they towed a fully loaded glider 3,000 miles from Canada to England in four legs, and it, it took 28 hours. It carried vaccines, blood plasma for Russia, B-24 bomber parts, equipment for Free French, a Ford truck, radio parts, and bananas. <laughs> Why bananas? Because in England at this point, they didn't have uh, bananas, and the pilot was English, and he said, oh, wouldn't that be great if we could put bananas in here? Remember the song? Yes, we have no bananas. Well, they didn't have any bananas, so they put the bananas in there. And he, this pilot was also the one who called it the voodoo. And, and he said, it seemed to have a connection with the Indian rope trick, okay? Now imagine, you have the C-47, and behind it you have, if it's being towed, is this glider, and behind that is a seaplane, the Catalina seaplane. Now the purpose of the seaplane was that if the glider crashed into the ocean, the seaplane was supposed to miraculously get the pilot and save, okay. But it didn't happen, thankfully, because I don't know if that could have ever been the case. I can't imagine what would have happened. So, this is, this is what happened. As you're going across the ocean, they hit three thunderstorms, sleet, snow, and it was snowing so much that the pilot inside the glider was, they couldn't, he couldn't, with a walkie-talkie, he couldn't even see the Douglas ahead of him. And he was freezing. And then, of all things, have you all seen these big barrage balloons, right? Well, they are also made here in Connecticut at, over in, at, at U.S. Rubber. They were all up and their last flight, they're going to be landing. And what happened is they went into barrage balloons. Now, these barrage balloons were huge. And they had, they had cables that came down. And on the cables, there were explosives. And the whole purpose of these barrage balloons is so that when the Germans came in to strafe the land, they, they would get hooked up into the cables, or they would, they would, they would um, crash, or they would, hit the, um, they would hit the cables and they would it'd explode. And here comes the Douglas C-47, and oh no, it goes into the, into the area where there's the barrage balloons, and behind it is the, is the glider, and they got tangled up, and at one point the glider was actually on top on the C-47, the, the seaplane said, oh, not for us. They turned around and they said, we're not going to go into, into that area. But they finally made it through um, safely and they landed in Scotland. And they made this cross-Atlantic trip. Do you ever think that they did it again? And no. They said, oh, okay, that was a good try, but this is not the way that we're going to get things across the Atlantic. And so that was the end of that. But it was not the end of for Pratt Reed. Now they decided, why don't we try a glider bomb prototype? Okay, so that, that would be led by remote control to a target by a carrier based aircraft and then released. It would carry 2,000 to 4,000 pounds of bombs. And James Gould said in his report, 
We successfully flew a secret bomb carrying glider, television controlled. But as we know, there, was a, there were bombs in Japan. They never used this. They only made the prototypes and that was, they, never, they never used the, the GLOM. And at the end of the war, um, of World War II, um, gliders had sort of seen their day, even they were very successful during the war, but now we had helicopters coming and, um, and new technology. We, we used a few of them, some of them in Korea, but this really was the last hurrah for, um, for, for gliders. And now I want to go back to the human element again. There was a gentleman who was interviewed um, by the high school students in this area in 1993. His name was H.J. Kurtz. He was born May 13, 1924 in Deep River. At 18, he worked for Pratt Reed on gliders. And he's so poetic. Quote, he said, I'd like to see the gliders when finished. They were so smooth and delicate. This gentleman was drafted on February 27th, 1943. And he said in his recollection, June 19th, 1944, I was in Normandy Beach on the French coast. The Germans expected us to land at Calais, so we didn't encounter much resistance. Still, the soldier's life expectancy on that beach was 17 seconds. When landing, all I could focus on was staying alive. Then I just wanted to be home so badly. The fear of German aircraft was constant. After walking many days, I saw something that made my heart soar. There in a Calais field was a Pratt Reed glider. I recognized it, but it seemed like such a long time ago. I could see blood on the beautiful hardwood and broken wings. Medics already removed the bodies. I climbed inside and saw the plaque made by the Pratt Reed Company, Deep River, Connecticut. There in that field, so far away, I found something familiar. I took it, he took that plaque to remind myself of where I was and where I was going. I have it still to this day. I still can't read this without, you know, getting very teary-eyed. Anyway, now Pratt Reed, of course, did incredible things and came up with this new innovation. But they were not the only ones in this state. Everywhere, electrical equipment, armaments, guns, chemicals, fighter planes, helicopters, hundreds of thousands of propellers, pontoons, millions of metals, surgical equipment, bombs, motors, millions and millions of shoes and boots, advanced optics, tools, advanced fuses, textiles, everything, even the Manhattan Project. It was incredible what Connecticut did during this war. And again, this was all due, yes, to the machines that we built and the war materials that we built, but we also because of the human element. And I truly believe that in times of division, whether what time, wherever they are or what, and, and during our history, that we can come together like we did in World War II and we can, thank you, <laughs> and we can do something and unite and, and perform. Thank you. Thank you.